Hi, this is Sholi Physics, APC Mechanics exam review number five. We're looking at rotational motion and moments of inertia in this session. All right, so the first thing I want to do is just talk about the uh, translational versus rotational analogs. Whenever you need an equation and you know how you would solve this situation translationally, you can also solve it rotationally if you know these analogs. So with a change of position, there's a change in angular position, or you can call it uh, angle. Um, a delta x would be a distance or displacement, so a delta theta would be an angular displacement measured in radians instead of meters. If we move on to um, velocity in translational motion measured in meters per second, there's also angular velocity omega measured in radians per second. When we keep that in radians, um, that's the real number angle. It's a, it's a um, referring to the actual dimensions of the, the circle, so uh, the unit circle. Um, moving on to acceleration, meters per second squared, there's angular acceleration and radians per second squared. Also, we uh, in the next session especially, we're going to, um, and at the end of this one, we're going to be looking at the rotational analog of mass, which is rotational inertia or moment of inertia, I. Um, and instead of F for force, there's uh, tau for torque. Um, now back it up just a moment. Uh, the units for uh, rotational inertia are in kilograms meters per second as we're going to see from the form over here. Um, the unit for torque is the Newton meter. Um, and just uh, one little point here to make. Um, there's another unit that is very similar. Um, you, you might want to write Newton meter when you're talking about work, but whenever you uh, respond to an answer talking about work, you, you do want to respond in joules because that is energy. Newton meters is not a unit of energy, it's a unit of torque. So please be careful with that. And instead of um, rotation, instead of uh, linear momentum P, there's angular momentum L. And um, that would be in uh, meters, kilograms, um, sorry, that'd be in kilograms, meters second, meters squared per second squared, or um, you can also think of it as um, the units for I times omega, which would be kilograms, meters squared times radians over uh, seconds per, per second. But uh, you, you wouldn't put the radians in there. So I'm just going off the fly here. Um, the kilograms, um, meters squared per second squared is the is the best unit there for angular momentum. All right, a uh, little bit about rotation uh, moments of inertia um, since we have it here. If you're talking about a point mass, so um, moment of inertia is all about how mass is distributed about an object's um, spinning axis. So if M is a point mass and is spinning the distance R from a Ax, uh, rotational axis, and the moment of inertia is m r squared. Um, another object that would have that same exact moment of inertia, given its mass and radius, would be a ring or a, a, um, a hollow disk. So uh, in that case, all the mass m is located at a position r, so it's straight up m r squared as well. Um, a ring of mass one kilogram and radius one meter has the same exact moment of inertia as a spinning mass on a on a string that has a um, mass of one kilogram and a length of the string of one meter. They would have exactly the same moment of inertia. <clears throat> when you get into a like a solid disk, it would have uh, a moment of inertia or, or any other shape um, as a fraction of that m r squared. Um, if you're talking about the moments of inertia about an axis through its center of mass, it's through its center of mass very specifically. Um, so over here, uh, moment of inertia has the form of some kind of uh, coefficient times mr squared. It's usually some kind of fraction. So for a disk, it's one half. With a disk, you don't have all of the mass on the outside, but it is distributed throughout that object. So um, the mass towards the center has less of an impact on its the solid disk's moment of inertia than the mass toward the outside of the disk. 
So because the mass is not just not all the way pushed out at the radius, it is um, it has a lesser moment of inertia. Uh, solid spheres two fifths mr squared, hollow sphere two thirds. You see how the solid one has a lesser moment of inertia if it has the same exact mass and, and radius than this uh, hollow sphere. So if we push all that mass out toward the outside of the sphere it would have a greater moment of inertia, but still not as much as if all the mass were located at a uh, set radius away. And think about a disk with a spinning axis like this. Some of that mass is located close to the axis and some is further out. So it's more like uh, a, a mass on the end of a string than a solid sphere, but it's not as close as a ring, as a solid disk ring or a, uh, a hollow disk ring. Um, bars, here's a bar, uh, moment of inertia 1 12th ml squared if you've got an axis through the center. Um, and uh, this is actually very similar to the disk, except it's uh, if you plug in a, a length instead of an r, that's why we're getting a different value out here. And if you have that, uh, that rod or that bar um, with a moment of inertia about a, an axis on the end of that bar, its moment of inertia is one third ml squared. Now, none of these you should really have to memorize. Uh, the problems often, if, if it's going to be important, will give that moment of inertia to you, or it's something like uh, given some other variables, you're going to have to uh, solve for i. Um, now, occasionally on an FRQ, I've, I've seen several FRQs throughout the years from 1980s up through um, mid 2010s. Um, occasionally they'll have you uh, derive the moment of inertia of a bar. Um, so you should be familiar with doing this. I'm going to go over that process toward the end of this presentation. So we get to um, rotational motion. So uh, backing up just a, a little bit, I was talking about those rotational analogs. So since you've got VF equals VO plus AT, you should be very, very familiar with that. Rotational analog is the angular, final angular velocity equals initial angular velocity plus angular acceleration times time. So that'd be like for a, let's say a fan or a disc that begins to accelerate or start its spin. Um, what would be the final angular velocity after accelerating its, its spin for a certain period of time? Now uh, this, there's a little very important note here. This is for a constant angular acceleration only. Um, that's how these equations over here were, were um, derived. Or actually, uh, usually you start with a and you integrate up to v and then up to x. So you get those velocity and displacements from the constant acceleration starting with that. Um, so just keep that in mind. So we also have uh, our uh, delta x equals v naught t plus 1 half at squared. That interprets to um, the displacement. What is the change in uh, angular position? equals initial angular velocity times time plus one half alpha t squared. Um, and our third equation has its own is has its form there also. Now these two, numbers one and two, are actually on the AP physics equation sheet. This third one is not. So if you ever need it and uh, you're just stuck in the, the test and you're like, oh I don't want to get my get anything mixed up. What, what's the equation? Um, just look back at this one and interpret it in your head. This is an omega final equals omega initial plus two alpha delta theta. So that would uh, give it to you if you need that. So remember, all these are for constant or average angular accelerations. Um, so if we're looking at an average or a constant angular velocity, um, we'd use delta theta over delta t. Um, but if we're trying to look at an instantaneous angular velocity, if there's uh, some kind of funky spin, a force turns on, a force turns off, there's a, uh, a force that changes as a function of time, you will need to think of um, angular, angular velocity as d theta dt um, to get that instantaneous. Uh, likewise for angular, uh, instantaneous angular acceleration is d omega dt. This also brings about, if uh, you've got a graph or a plot, um, of let's say theta over time, then the slope of that graph is the angular velocity, the instantaneous angular velocity at any time. And the slope of a 
uh, omega versus time graph. An angular velocity versus time graph is the angular acceleration at that moment. Um, so if you don't have a constant angular acceleration, um, you'll probably want to start with one if this is a angular acceleration that's time dependent. Keep in mind that um, don't get them mixed up, <laughs> okay? Omega is not the derivative of alpha, okay? It is the integral, okay? So we're going to integrate. Alpha is the, the omega dt. So just write out those definitions before you go chugging in too fast. Um, I might have done that the last time I, I gave this presentation. So, uh, or sometimes I like to make mistakes for my students. So th this is a common uh, uh, Schollenbarger and student mistake. So be careful with that and be thoughtful before you just go jumping in. Um, so you'd want to integrate that. Okay. Uh, looks like I do that here. So if you integrate, you get uh, 2t cubed over 3 plus 4t as the omega. And um, keep in mind that this, this over here would be from like an, an initial omega to a final omega. So it'll give you a change in omega um, equals that result. Also, keep in mind that, doo -doo -doo -doo, move it up, there it is, uh, omega instantaneous is d theta dt. So d theta equals omega dt. We also would integrate that over here. So integrate once again, and you'd get a displacement function for that time-dependent acceleration. Here's an example, a spinning disc with a radius of a half meter, I'll put that little detail in up there, is dropped to the ground and initially, when it hits the ground, is rolling at a rate of 46 radians per second. Its angular acceleration is negative two radians per second squared. How far does it roll and how long does it take to stop? So it gives you a rate of angular acceleration, an initial rolling speed, 46 radians per second. Um, how long does it take to stop and how far does it roll? Okay, um, so we need to interpret a spinning motion into a translational motion, which brings about uh, one little thing I think I forgot to, to cover up here, something very important. The connection between that translational motion and rotational motion are these expressions. All right, this one you are very familiar with since geometry. This is how you calculate um, circumference the entire circumference or, or arc length around a circle. Um, circumference is the entire arc length around a circle. So if you uh, find the circumference, you want to multiply the radius by the total angle of a circle, two pi. So two pi r is evident right here in s equals r theta. So if you'd like to find just a, a portion of that arc length, s, um, you just take r times the angle in radians. Likewise, um, if you'd like to find the edge speed, the tangential velocity of a rotating disk, or actually the velocity of any point on a rotating object, um, just pick the radius um, to that point, so the, the distance between the center, or the axis of rotation, and the point on the rotating object, and you'll find the velocity, the tangential velocity of that point. So it's like a bug on a record player or something, or a record or something like that. Um, that used to be the old one uh, that gave it to us. But as long as you have the rotational speed of that rotating system and the radius or the distance between the axis of rotation and that point, you can find the velocity. Now, in addition, this one is very handy thinking about wheels. As wheels turn, and as long as they're not slipping, if there's no slippage, if you ever hear that, then the edge speed is equal to the translation to speed at the center of mass, or the, the axle, axle of that wheel. All right, so whenever a wheel turns, it has to come into contact with the ground and not slip, which means it has to be moving at the same relative speed as the ground, which is zero. So if the bottom of the wheel is stopped for an instant when it touches the, the ground, and at the top it's overtaking the axle, that means at the top it's moving at twice the translational speed, and at the bottom, it's moving equal to the translational speed in the opposite direction. So what is 50 miles per hour of a car with its axle plus a negative 50 miles per hour of the, the spin of the wheel? Zero. That's why the wheel touches without slipping. So um, this vehicle's R-Omega is very handy 
when you're when you're comparing the edge speed of a wheel to its uh, the velocity of the center or the, the axle of that wheel could be the car that's attached to it and we also have uh, the tangential acceleration of the edge or of a point on that spinning disc um, equals r alpha so keep those in mind never forget those I think the middle one's the only one that's actually on the um, AP exam table information and equation sheet so do please remember these other two super important okay Keep, always keep those in your back pocket ready to use them. So moving down here, we're going to need that to solve this problem, this question. How long does it take to accelerate from zero, from 46 uh, down to zero to, to slow down to, to a stop? So it's final omega is zero, initial is 46. We're solving for the time and delta x. So looking at uh, what we're given here to uh, the initial and final omegas, the alpha and the time, this is the best expression to use. We plug in a final of zero, an initial of 46, an acceleration of negative two. If you ever end up with a negative time, just check your signs or make sure you put the numbers in the right spot. You might have actually put the accidentally put the 46 in the, in the final instead of the initial. So that, that's a common problem, uh, common error. So we get a time of 23 seconds. Now, what about the final position? Don't let that throw you. Just keep in mind that the... Um, the velocity and the displacement do um, relate to the angular velocity and angular displacement. So if we find the angular displacement, we can also find the displacement of the, the car or the, the wheel. Uh, so here we go. Um, if we're looking for angular displacement, the third equation of angular motion here, constant angular accelerating motion, um, this is the most direct equation to use. Our final is zero, the initial is 46. The uh, angular acceleration is negative two radians per second squared. And we solve for that delta theta. So I get 529 radians. Well, it's an easy process then of figuring out the arc length of the, the distance that the outer wheel moves along the ground. So we just multiply the radius of the wheel, 0 0.05 meters times the, the radians, and we get 26.45 meters. So don't forget that s equals r theta comes in very handy. So that's some angular motion. Now moving into moments of inertia. Keep in mind these uh, several things. Further out the mass is distributed, the greater the moment of inertia, and the less the acceleration because the angular acceleration depends on Newton's second law for rotational motion. Instead of f equals ma, we have torque equals i alpha. So the further out the mass is, that would be a greater I and a lower angular acceleration. So for a given uh, unchanging torque, if we increase, you know, let's say it might be gravity, uh, the weight of, a, of an object being pulled down a hill. So that, that weight's going to be the same on a one kilogram object, whether it's mass distributed way out here or close in here. So uh, Given a constant torque due to like an unbalanced wheel that's allowed to roll down a ramp, um, the greater the I, the lesser the A. So um, in my class, we do an uh, activity involving a, a ring, a solid disc, and several different objects with mass distributed differently. They're all the same size, approximately the same mass. We roll them down a hill, and you'd expect them all to get down to the bottom at the same time, but the ring. The, the one that's empty in the middle and has all its mass on the outside is the slowest to get down. And the one that has most of its mass toward the inside is the fastest to get down because that moment of inertia is the least when the masses are close in. Okay, so uh, we've got torque equals I alpha or alpha equals torque over I. So there we can see a little more clearly, the greater the I, the lesser the alpha. Okay. Um, all right. Parallel axis theorem. What if you're given a moment of inertia um, about some weird object like a violin? We're spinning a violin. Now, please don't do that. They are wonderful instruments. Um, let's say we're spinning a violin or something weird like that. Um, and you're given a moment of inertia about the 
middle. But this time what you're going to be doing is hanging the violin from a pivot on this little neck where it curls up. We're going to put it on a string. Okay, and we're going to allow it to swing like this. Well, with the moment of inertia about the center of mass, how could you figure out the moment of inertia for this weird shaped object at the end? We could use the parallel axis theorem. So as long as there's an, an axis that is parallel to the moment of inertia about the center of mass, um, all we got to do is take the mass of the object and multiply it by the square of the distance between that center mass and that parallel axis. So uh, if you compare the moment of inertia of a rod with um, an axis through the center to the end, we could plug in the moment of inertia of that rod through the center is 1 12th ml squared. Now if we move that axis to the end of the rod, we're only moving it half the length of the rod. So we're going to use a parallel axis theorem here, plug in the mass, and the distance that we're going to uh, change the axis by is half the length of the rod. So you plug all that in and simplify, and voila, you get the moment of inertia about a rod through the end of it. And uh, that's what I remind you about earlier on. Here they are, 1 12th through the center of mass and 1 third through the end. So the moment of uh, the uh, parallel axis theorem is one of those things that uh, comes in handy. It should be a tool in the back of your pocket. Um, you should be ready to take that out. And finally, it's what you've been waiting for. But if you actually have to derive or integrate for a moment of inertia, uh, what you do is conceptually think about a little slice of mass of an object. We'll take a, a rod here. This is one of those commonly, if it's going to be on the uh, FRQ section, um, it's going to be a rod. That's, that's what it's been in the past. Uh, some of the other ones are a little too funky to be on a, an AP test. So if you consider this rod a little piece of mass, it's a distance r away, and it's a little piece of mass, dm. Okay, And what we need to do to figure out the, the total moment of inertia is sum up the moments of inertia of all these little dms as we go from a small r to a big r. So you can see what I'm doing with my highlighter here. I'm summing them up. That's what this expression says. We're going to sum all the, see it still has that, that format of mass times r squared, but it's a little dm, a little piece of mass times r squared. What you often have to do here is come up with what is dm in terms of r, because that r does change as we go further and further out. So uh, you do that um, with a rod by thinking about the linear mass density. Now, if you look at the, the rod like from the end, like going in toward, towards the inside of the rod there, um, the, the, the area, the cross-sectional area, let's say it's like a pepperoni, okay, as you go in towards the rod, that doesn't change. The only thing that, that's changing here that, that matters is how far out we go. So where are those slices of pepperoni? Um, the further out they are, the more they're going to have an impact on the moment of inertia. A uh, greater moment of inertia has its mass pushed out to the outside. So uh, linear mass density okay, is lambda. It's not really important, though. What, what, what matters is if we take a ratio of the total mass of the rod divided by the total length of the rod, that's going to be equal to the ratio of a little dm times the little tiny, let me back it up here from all my marks, okay? You notice that the dm has a really tiny width, dr. So uh, the ratio m to l should have the same ratio as dm to dr, as long as it's a uniform, a rod with uniform, uh, a uniform mass distribution. That's the word. So if you uh, solve for what dm is, if m over l is the dm over dr, then m divided by l times dr, bring that up here, is equal to dm. And then you just simply substitute that in there. Uh, the dm is now ml, m over l dr. That's substituted in for dm. Um, we take the integral with respect to r and work it all out. Oh, what, what is this? This is important also. The bounds. Um, our moment of inertia is from the end of the rod out. So the, the first radius is going to be at radius value is going to be at zero. And the last radius value of that little slice of dm is going to be at the length l. So we're going to take it from zero to l. 
and sum up all those moments of inertia, and you get one third ml squared. Look at that. Now, what if our, our axis of rotation was at the center? Then I would integrate from negative L over two to positive L over two. So this would be negative L over two to positive L over two. This being where um, R is equal to zero. And you would get, surprise, surprise, 1 12th ML squared. So there's the integration for, um, for a rod. Uh, it's really, really good, if, especially if you're going in to, to see some more physics. You should know how to do this also for a, um, a disc and even a sphere. What's a good, good fun one is to try out a thick-walled hollow sphere. That, that's a good one to try out, but not when you're reviewing for AP tests. So don't waste your time with that until after the AP test. I hope this has been a helpful session. Um, good luck on that test. I'm sure it's coming up soon.